Next month marks an important moment for the National Theatre. It will mark 10 years of Nick Heitner's tenure as the artistic director of the theatre. Uh, shortly after Nick took over as artistic director, down the road at the Old Vic, Ian McKellen paid his homage to the major form of British vernacular drama when he played Pantomime Dame in Aladdin. One of the things that I suspect he didn't know, uh, and I'm pretty sure nobody else in the room other than Nick knows, is that Nick has also played Pantomime Dame. <laughs> it may have been that experience as an undergraduate in Cambridge that finally convinced him that perhaps his future did not lie as an actor, uh, though I have very happy memories of that particular production, uh, but instead as a director. As a director, it was already apparent in the way that true talent does show itself at that stage that Nick's career was going to be extraordinary. It wasn't simply the quality of individual productions, but the astonishing ambition of the work that he put on as still then a teenager, including a production of Brecht's Mahogany, in which at some points the orchestra and singers were within two bars of each other, uh, but rarely. Um, <laughs> nobody had quite worked out how to locate a conductor by closed circuit television in such a way that the singers could see him. Uh, but uh, in, amidst that extraordinary array of work, one production stands out for me, and that was the very last production that Nick did as an, as an undergraduate, a production of Love's Labour's Lost in Trinity Hall Fellows Garden in May Week. Um, Shakespeare in May Week is a good old Cambridge tradition, but there was something about the bittersweet elegiac tone of that particular production, which I found deeply moving. From Cambridge, he went on to a career that we all know well, with productions in opera, and I think opera has underpinned a great deal of his theatre work, uh, rather than the theatre work underpinning uh, the opera work, and of course in film. Um, one of the characteristics of Nick's reign so far as artistic director at the National has been the extraordinary commitment to new drama. I can't think of an earlier point at which the entire repertory of particular stages has consisted of nothing more than new plays. When Peter Hall established the Royal Shakespeare Company, he uh, offered it as mantra for the approach to Shakespeare the belief that each Shakespeare play had to be produced as if it had dropped through the letterbox that morning as if it were to a brand new play. And that has been part of Nick Heitner's work at the National Theatre in particular. Boyka mentioned that production of Henry V, which was made, made clear that the decision to go to war was entirely based on a dodgy dossier of the kind that was oh so familiar and oh so painful in our immediate concerns with what was happening here, just as last year's Time of Athens was firmly based on an awareness not only of the Occupy movement, but also of Enron and what it means for hypercapitalism to implode with, in, in fraudulent ways, uh, the cost to everybody about it. And two in his Hamlet of the previous year, in which Elsinore was a castle of surveillance and security a political reading of the play, which for me has never been bettered. Alongside that kind of work for Nick Heitner has also gone his own connection with a particular kind of recent new play. Uh, and I'm thinking of the work of Alan Bennett, with whom uh, there, there has been such a striking partnership. In his introduction to the script of, of People, <coughs> Alan Bennett says that he quotes Ellen Terry describing theatre as hard work and then goes on to say, but of course she was never in the rehearsal room with Nick Heitner. <laughs> what underpins Nick's rehearsal world is hard work and a spirit of fun that is itself the basis for discovery. And the discovery is always tightly pinned to a profound understanding of the play itself. Over and over again, Nick shows us moments in the plays that we've forgotten about, that we haven't understood, that we haven't followed through on because of that concern over detail. At the moment, he's a week into rehearsals for Othello, uh, a production starring two actors who have worked with him in major roles before. Rory Kinnear is, is Iago and was Hamlet. Adrian Lester is Othello and was Henry V. But it's not Othello that gives him the title of today's lecture, but instead, Hamlet, stand and unfold yourself. Nick Heitner. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Peter. It's an honour and a pleasure to give this lecture named for one of the very great Shakespeareans, Stanley Wells. And it gives me just as much delight that the invitation came from Peter Holland, who taught me much of what I know about the Elizabethan theatre, and who continues to be a stimulating and provocative source of ideas whenever I put Shakespeare's plays on the stage. Uh, I'm hoping this lecture goes better than the Cambridge tutorial I remember, better I hope than he does, <coughs> even 35 years later. The subject of the tutorial was the changeling, that lurid collaboration between Thomas Middleton and William Rowley. The problem was straightforward. Uh, I'd been out late the night before and I hadn't read the play. <laughs> there, were two under, uh, there were two other undergraduates present who had strong opinions about it, and at some point it became necessary for me to have strong opinions too, so I took a deep breath and had some. I've gone blank on what they were, but I have now read the play, and I've seen it and suffered through those interminable madhouse scenes several times too often, and I'd like to say that I was right first time. <laughs> Staying out late and not reading the play was practical criticism of rare perspicacity. <laughs> Twenty odd years before The Changeling saw the light of day, a rather better play opened at the Globe Theatre by another of Middleton's collaborators. Two sentries meet on the battlements of Elsinore in the dead of night. One of them is cold, the other <coughs> scared. Who's there? shouts one to the other. It's what sentries ask each other, but these two don't know the half of it. It turns out to be a very big question indeed, and Hamlet spends much of the play grappling with it. Francisco, the second sentry, ducks it. Nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself. In other words, never mind who's there, show me who you are. Stand and unfold yourself, you might say, is what Hamlet wants from everyone around him. It's what he wants from himself. He spends the whole play struggling with himself, trying to unfold himself to himself. He tries in vain to persuade those around him, his mother, his girlfriend, his friends, even the ghost of his father, to reveal themselves fully to him. It's maybe because he fails in that enterprise that he finally launches himself heedlessly into an action that leads to his own death. But for those of us involved with the performance of Shakespeare's plays, it is the injunction, stand and unfold yourself, that tells us how to do them. In the Academy, Shakespeare's text can be the be-all and the end-all. In the theatre, I urge you to be very suspicious of actors or directors who tell you they aim to do just the play or that they've found everything in the text. On stage, the text is only part of the story. All plays on the page are like, newts in, are like notes in a musical score. They require the, particip the participation of the player before they become music. To make theatre, an actor has to unfold himself to make a personal connection with the text. Of all playwrights, Shakespeare requires the most intense interaction between his characters and those who would act them, between his world and our world, between his plays and his audience. Actor, director, and spectator must all unfold themselves to be receptive to the process that brings these plays alive. It's possible to stage Shakespeare on a stage that is naked almost of everything except speech, without any of the concrete reality of the world outside the stage, and theoretically, no filter between play and audience, nothing to stop a direct communication of thought and feeling. There's a respectable argument for this. As far as we know, the plays, or at least the plays that were initially staged outdoors at the Globe, were staged with no scenery and the bare minimum of furniture and props. It's true that several of the later plays were written for the exclusive indoor theatre at Blackfriars and called for a degree of spectacle that would not be out of place to Broadway musical, but from what we know of the outdoor theatres, there would appear to be impressive precedent for the idea that the plays need nothing more than the actors and the text, and that any form of interpretative intervention between text and audience is some kind of violation. I'm not convinced of this, and I'm sure you aren't either. Just for a start, I don't think Shakespeare conceives of his characters shorn of the physical reality of the world around them. I have stage plays which do exactly that. Uh, in Racine's Phaedre, the detritus of real life is rigorously excluded. The French neoclassical theatre, in self-conscious imitation of the Greek, reduces suffering to its essentials. Phaedra doesn't eat or drink or sit down, and she certainly doesn't go off like Shakespeare's Cleopatra to play billiards. There is no time for billiards in a world where literally every waking thought is consumed by the need to take your disobliging stepson into your bed and the subsequent need to conceal it from your husband. The intensity of the tragic experience requires a single-minded focus on the central action alone, 
Nothing else matters in Racine's Greece. Shakespeare's Egypt, on the other hand, is a world where you not only decide to play billiards, but you have a maid who doesn't want to play billiards because she has a sore arm, and he suggests that you'd be better off playing billiards with your eunuch. Indeed, all Shakespeare's plays are steeped in the mess of real life and seem to me not to respond well to the kind of staging that it aims to strip them back to their essentials. The power even of the great tragedies springs from their ruthless observation of the ambiguities and indignities of the real world. This isn't to say that a literal reflection of the real world is the only way of revealing what the plays have to say about it. Is Elsinore, for instance, less a concrete image of the world than a series of theatrical ideas that are thematically expressive rather than suggestive of a real center of government or royal court? And how might an expressive and how might an expressionistic uh, Elsinore work? How would it unlock what the play has to say about the real world? Well, one of the play's chief concerns is human authenticity. It's one of Hamlet's obsessions. He's possessed by the apparent, apparent impossibility of being authentically oneself or of knowing others authentically. Is it possible to completely unfold yourself or anyone else to even, or even, sorry, is it possible to completely unfold yourself to anyone else or even to yourself? What constitutes truthful behavior? What indeed is truth? Hamlet often thinks about truth by thinking about theater. At his mother's wedding, he has that within which passes show. Show is what his mother and his uncle do. They seem, he knows not seems. He isn't theatrical. <laughs> but later in the play, acting becomes more authentic to him than his own behavior. The player king weeps real tears for Hecuba, tears Hamlet should be shedding for his father. And when the players present the murder of Gonzago in front of the king, they say something far truer about Denmark than the show put on by Denmark's government. So you might start from the undeniable premise that Hamlet happens not in a palace, but in a theater. Elsinore is less important in this kind of production than the constant reminder that the play is happening on a stage. As Hamlet agonizes over the nature of reality, so in the theater, reality might be undermined by imagery suggestive of his internal struggles. Hamlet appears as a white-faced clown. Ophelia is a marionette. Her father pulls her strings. I've seen a Hamlet where the stage walls themselves dissolved at the touch. The director and designer responding to the play's febrile uncertainty about the solidity of objective reality, unfolding it through a closely argued series of theatrical coups. I'm often thrilled by this kind of show. One way of unfolding yourself to the play and of unfolding the play to the audience is by treating the stage with a poetic freedom analogous to Shakespeare's verse at its most exploratory. There are plays that sink under the weight of too literal a response to the world they purport to represent. The Tempest set on a real desert island, it's like Treasure Island without the parrot. <laughs> the late plays in particular gain from an approach that embraces the much explored notion that the theater itself is an image of the world. Meanwhile, in many of the romantic comedies, Shakespeare plays with the idea that the experience of love remakes reality that the lover, like the lunatic and the poet, shapes the worlds according to the dictates of his own fantasy. Unfold yourself to a play like A Midsummer Night's Dream or Twelfth Night, and you're very quickly imagining on stage a high fantastical world shaped by fancy. And yet, the world of Twelfth Night is also a world of late Tudor gentility, a world with a strict domestic hierarchy where fancy is undermined by cakes, ale, and box hedges. Much Ado About Nothing is almost free of fancy, always better served by productions as down to earth as the relationship between Beatrice and Benedict, the least delusional couple in all of Shakespeare, and therefore ultimately the happiest. And in the end, I think that the political plays, the great tragedies in particular, always work best when rooted in a coherent world. An audience will hear better Hamlet's internal debate about theatrical theatricality and truth and will experience better his struggles with the idea of, him, of himself if it experiences with him the world that has brought him to his crisis. I want to be immersed in his world with him more than I want to watch a commentary on it. What then is his world? When was it? When did King Lear divide his kingdom? 2,000 years ago? 400 years ago? Yesterday? How modern is Elsinore? And how contemporary is the government of Denmark? Hamlet was certainly conceived as an entirely contemporary play. It's about a surveillance state, a totalitarian monarchy with a highly developed spy network. 
It's a barely disguised image of the system uh, under which those who first watched the play lived. Elizabeth I exerted control through an internal security system that must have impinged on everyone who watched its first performance. At Elsinore, you can't unfold yourself without risking your life. Everything is observed. Everything is suspect. No social gesture is trustworthy. Polonius, the spy master, sends one of his staff to spy even on his son. He forces his daughter to spy on her lover. And meanwhile, Hamlet's oldest friends are hired by the king to spy on Hamlet. Shakespeare's audience knew exactly what the play was talking about. Many of Shakespeare's colleagues at some time or other found themselves behind bars for saying the wrong thing in front of the wrong person at the wrong time. His most talented colleague was a spy and was almost certainly murdered because he fell foul of his spy master. There's an unimpeachable argument for creating on stage a vivid image of the late Elizabethan world from which the play sprang. But when I did it at the National in 2010, I felt strongly that to do so would rob a contemporary audience of something that Shakespeare's audience took for granted. They came to the theatre as much to watch themselves on stage as they did to watch the downfall of princes greater than themselves. Hamlet does not ask, ask us to marvel at a strange world, but to recognise our own. Now, few of us in London can pretend that we know what it's like to live in a security state, but I did very much want to create on stage a world that would Im be immediately and viscerally recognisable as a world where you put your life in danger by saying the wrong thing. In Shakespeare's tragedies, the personal and the political reflect each other. The internal and social lives of the tragic hero are inextricably linked. Hamlet is paralyzed as much by the barrier the state puts in the way of anyone knowing anyone else as he is by his desperate search to know what's going on inside himself. So Elsinore at the National resembled a post-Soviet Central European dictatorship. It wasn't a replica, and it wasn't specific about exact location and period in the same way as the play is opportunistic about period and location. But although it was a world invented for the stage, it was specific in its detail. A Baroque palace, now the centre of a modern security state, kitted out with the hardware of the security state and inhabited by the kind of people who know what it's like to live in terror of their neighbour. The king's personal guard are referred to in the text as Switzers, which sounds satisfyingly like the name of some contemporary tyrant's secret police. Literally, they are Swiss mercenaries hired by Claudius and presumably before him by the old king. Another advantage of the world we created on stage was that it created an immediate reference point for an audience far more familiar with the Eastern European secret police than with late 16th century Swiss mercenaries. An audience vividly aware of the dangers of saying the wrong thing in such a world, even if, unlike their Elizabethan equivalents, they don't live in it. This mattered particularly when Hamlet gets the visiting actors to perform an old play in front of the king about the murder of a duke by his villainous brother. The performance of this play, The Murder of Gonzago, should be fraught with danger. I've too often seen it defanged by theatrical flummery. In the Nationals production, everyone on stage was aware of how close to the wind the players were sailing. And the players themselves knew what Hamlet was asking them to do. James Lawrenson, as the player king, came close to refusing to do it. Shakespeare knew from personal experience how dangerously subversive the performance of an old play could be. On the eve of the Earl of Essex's attempted coup against Elizabeth I, the rebels persuaded Shakespeare's company to put on a special performance of Richard II, a play about a successful rebellion against a reigning monarch at the Globe. The Essex Rebellion wasn't a success. Essex lost his head, and the Lord Chamberlain's men were in extremely hot water. They only narrowly escaped jail. I was reminded of this only a couple of months ago, when I was talking to a Hungarian colleague who runs a theatre in Budapest. Hungary is currently in, under the control of a regime that is proto-fascist and virulently anti-Semitic. One of my colleague's friends has been removed from his post at a neighbouring theatre simply for being Jewish. My colleague is afraid to stage plays openly critical of his government because if he did so, he could be closed down. So he staged a series of productions whose messages are coded. He produced Moliere's The Misanthrope last year as a contemporary play about the consequences of speaking the truth to totalitarian power and his defense was that he was staging a play about the life of a writer at the court of Louis XIV. More recently, he staged a contemporary Polish play called Our Class, which we produced at the National a couple of years ago. It's a furious denunciation of pre- and post-war Polish anti-Semitism, but Budapest audiences got the point. 
This is the kind of theatre that Shakespeare was writing about. At Elsinore, the entire court must know what this suspiciously timely revival of the murder of Gonzago is suggesting. Can there be anyone at Elsinore who actually believes that the old king was killed by a snake bite in the orchard? They must all know, or at least strongly suspect, what happened to the old king Hamlet, even if none of them dare talk about it. Even now, in the 21st century, we suspect foul play when a dictator dies suddenly. So Hamlet turns to the theatre to say something too dangerous to be said out loud, and the reason he commissions the players to revive the murder of Gonzago is to catch the conscience of the king. He's not expecting his audience to watch the play in a spirit of critical detachment. The purpose of playing, he tells the actors, is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature. Show the audience the truth about yourselves, themselves, their world. Unfold yourselves. I'm pretty sure he expected his audience to assume that the players who never again appear after Claudia stops the performance to end up in jail. That's certainly how we did it at the National. These plays were raw and immediate when they first hit the stage. They were all contemporary plays, even when they were set in ancient Rome. And my experience is that they become visceral, viscerally alive when treated, even now, as contemporary texts. I've never made it a rule. Leonardo's large and hospitable household in Much Ado About Nothing seemed to me to be no less immediate located in 16th century Sicily than it would have been set anywhere at any time else. It helps always that rigor about time and place barely registers amongst the conventions of the Elizabethan stage, so that in the way it moved, felt, and thought, the onstage community in Much Ado was as much an image of the community it played to in the Olivier Theatre as it was an image of Shakespeare's invented synthesis of rural England and small town Sicily. But it's no accident that my least successful, certainly my least interesting production at the National was of the two parts of Henry IV. I was overawed, perhaps, by their extraordinarily complete picture of England in the throes of civil war. They're politically sophisticated, wonderfully rich in detail. They range from council chamber to battlefield, to the inns of East Cheap, to the orchards of Gloucestershire, from the King of England to Francis the Potboy. And at their center is a relationship which would exist truthfully in almost any context. The son of a powerful man, resentful of his obligations and only too aware of his father's disappointment in him, finds solace and something like love in the company of a hard drinking old reprobate who gives him license to behave exactly as he wants to behave. But I felt that to set a play about civil war in contemporary Britain would say nothing interesting about us now, or about the reign of Henry IV, or about late Elizabethan England. The plays are driven by a specifically Tudor terror of a return to the bloody chaos of the Wars of the Roses. Henry IV's story is fueled by the particular uncertainty of a regicide about whether he passes his guilt on to his son. You might argue that you'd get more value from the low-life scenes if they were set in the pubs and clubs of contemporary London, but I'd probably argue in return that a modern audience would see nothing particularly transgressive about a young Prince of Wales knocking about the streets of London with a bunch of troublemakers. <laughs> you might also argue that the plays are entirely Elizabethan in texture and behavioral detail, even if they're ostensibly concerned with late medieval history, and I'd agree. Indeed, we created a stage world that was rooted in Elizabethan England, which is, of course, 200 years later than the period the play refers to, though I'm not sure how many people noticed. And I'm not sure that I gave a superb company of actors a provocative enough context. I was determined not to mess, for instance, with those great scenes in Gloucestershire, which were quite brilliantly played by Michael Gambon as Falstaff and John Wood as Shallow. But they're tougher and less sentimental than I realized and could have fitted quite happily into less bland a production, one that might in style have taken more from the extraordinary freedom with which Shakespeare offers his commentary on Tudor politics. Unfolding myself to these plays, I should have confronted their contradictions and looked past the historical chronicle. Theatrically, they have more of the imaginative wildness of the comedies than I'd registered. Henry V was a different matter entirely. Uh, at the National in the spring of 2003, it opened a matter of weeks after the invasion of Iraq. It would have been perverse not to play it as a contemporary text. The production wasn't about the Iraq war. It remained a play about the victor of Agincourt. But in performance, it seemed constantly to throw light on current preoccupations. A striking example from the start of the play, which Peter's already alluded to. Henry plans the invasion of France an action recommended in Henry IV, part two by his father to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. 
It's a cynical exercise in domestic politics to unite the nation by taking it to war. But he needs rock-solid justification in law. The Archbishop of Canterbury obliges the king before the council by providing him at great length with an analysis of the ancient Salic law and its applicability to the French succession, which rather dubiously, he claims, allows the king to invade France. Besides, their writers say, King Pepin, which deposed Childeric, which deposed Childeric, did as heir general, being descended of Blithold, which was the daughter of King Clothair, may claim entitled the crown of France, Hugh Capet also, who usurped the crown of Charles, the Duke of Lorraine, sole male heir of the true line and stock of Charles the Great, conveyed himself as the heir to the Lady Linger, and so on, ad infinitum. Uh, in the Nationals' production, as he spoke, the Archbishop had an elaborately produced dossier around a modern cabinet table, and the scene made concrete a sense of historical continuity. War leaders have always gone to great trouble to massage the case for war. Maybe the same point could have been made had the scene been staged as a medieval council of war, but the big game was in immediacy and clarity. The audience, force-fed by news media on UN resolutions and dodgy dossiers, caught on instantly and listened intently to the sinuous substance of the Archbishop's argument. The questions begged by its bizarre contortions seemed both rooted in history and utterly of the moment. Is this interpretation of international law true? Is it relevant? Is it right? A long speech that is often played purely for laughs sucked the audience right in. A large portion of the play turned out to be about presentation. The king's rhetoric always in the service of spinning, first the build-up to the war, then the initial, initially perilous progress of the campaign, then its aftermath. We gained a vivid impression that Shakespeare was writing for us now. We lost, of course, its corollary, the indisputable truth that Shakespeare was writing for his own audience then, the source of so much of the most exciting work that has come out of the Academy in recent years. This was, in 2003, a serious loss, but not a permanent one. There's always next time. With time of Athens, next time generally seems to mean next time there's a financial crisis. At the National last year, I think many in our audience discovered for the first time this bitter portrait of a world consumed by greed and of a man whose estimation of his own worth is purely financial. It would have taken a theatrical imagination less opportunistic than mine not to recognize in time, and as many other directors have recognized, a mirror of our own world and the authorial participation of Thomas Middleton, particularly in the first satirical half of the play, made its presentation as a contemporary city comedy all the more effective. The second half of the play is much stranger and much less literal. The high definition satiric detail of the first half skewers the world of money and power. It's about a man who spends more than he has, finds himself buried under a mountain of debt, and is done over by a bunch of unscrupulous bankers, politicians, and their disgusting hangers-on in the arts world. Uh, the second half is more experimental and more Shakespearean, and my job was to translate the imagery of the modern city into something that would allow Simon Russell Beale to unfold his own internal landscape. Uh, the suggestion of an urban wasteland left behind maybe by a failed building development echoed Timon's spiritual wasteland, but it left all the work to the actor, who was working with an unfinished text that required more than his personal response. This one required bending to his will. It's never true of a play, any play, that all the answers are available in the text. It isn't how plays work. Novels can aspire to provide everything you need to know, but plays, like musical scores, are instructions for performance. The life in them only dimly, det dimly detectable until they're performed. Shakespeare, wrote scripts for his fellow company members. Many of his scripts, Henry V and Hamlet, to name only two, were improved versions of scripts by other playwrights already in the company's repertoire. Nowadays, we'd call Shakespeare in to do the rewrites. Certainly, he seemed to care nothing for the publication of his scripts. So maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that he leaves so much to his actors, and that one of the remarkable features of his plays is how suggestive they are of lives that vibrate well outside the confines of the action. Even Shakespeare's great parts ask more questions than they answer and require an actor to fill in fascinating gaps left quite deliberately. His smaller parts, however striking, 
often leave the actor almost all the work of creating a character with a real biography. Working on Hamlet, Rory Kinnear and I repeatedly find that, found that Shakespeare simply left stuff out, stuff that would have made the play last as long as War and Peace if he put it in. <laughs> this was initially frustrating. What, for instance, are we supposed to think has really gone on between Hamlet and Ophelia before the play starts? That things have gone on is plain from the pile of letters she refers to him. I did love you once, he says, though he never says why he stopped loving her. And I've seen this done so sardonically that it's impossible to believe. And a couple of lines later, he says, I loved you not, which doesn't make it any easier to know whether he did, although it's the kind of contradiction lovers go in for. In any event, it feels like there's a missing scene, a scene near the start of the play for Hamlet and Ophelia that allows you to experience how they are with each other before things start to go wrong. You don't see them together until he's apparently mad. But the genius of the play, as opposed to, say, War and Peace, is that it is suggestive of multitudes as much as it contains them. A good Hamlet will unavoidably reveal himself as much as he reveals Hamlet. And it is in the combination of the two that the text comes alive. As it happens, in the way he said, I did love you once, Rory Kinnear made you believe that they were profoundly devoted to each other, that he was heartbroken, maybe by his own mistrust of her, that, and that he pushed her away. He didn't need the missing scene. In five words, he told you what would have taken Tolstoy in his chosen medium, the novel, four chapters. The play text, in other words, forces an actor to ask questions which he answers through the way he delivers it. What did Hamlet feel for Ophelia? What does he feel now? What does he want from her? What, within himself and in Denmark, makes it impossible for him to trust himself or trust her or the world around him? A play's meaning is conferred on it by the act of playing it. So Shakespeare's texts require an actor always to consider what is not in them as much as what is. And approached without preconceptions, they also turn out to be not entirely trustworthy about what's actually there. Actors should never entirely trust what their char characters say about themselves to other characters, nor what other characters say about them. Ambiguity and contradiction are Shakespearean hallmarks. Uh, although Hamlet is, for the most part, painfully honest about himself, as we've seen, he contradicts himself about whether he loved Ophelia or not. Stage tradition has it that he adored his father, and there's textual evidence for it. Here's what Hamlet says about him. He was a man, taken for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. But one of the most striking things about the scene between Hamlet and his father's ghost is that the ghost utters not one affectionate word toward his son. The old king is consumed entirely with his own situation, which I suppose is understandable. <laughs> He's only recently been murdered by his brother and is now obliged to watch from purgatory as the same brother beds his wife, under which circumstances we might all of us find ourselves obsessed by thoughts of revenge. But the absence of anything recognizable as a bond between father and son led us to examine the whole nature of their relationship. We know that the old king was a brutal warrior. We know that Hamlet is a 30-year-old graduate student who's been absent from his father's court for many years. They have little in common, and it is the gulf between them, more than the bond between them, that consumes young Hamlet and makes it impossible for him to take immediate action in response to the ghost's demand for revenge. Sometimes in rehearsal, you notice that the text doesn't necessarily support what you assume to be centuries of performance practice. In the scene between Hamlet and his mother Gertrude, at the height of their impassioned argument with each other, the ghost reappears to remind Hamlet not to forget what he's been told to do. Alas, he's mad, says Gertrude, as Hamlet struggles to control himself. Whereon do you look, she asks, apparently unable to see what Hamlet sees. But when you think about it, you're forced to wonder why Gertrude can't see the ghost. Everyone else who comes across him sees him perfectly clearly. Horatio sees him. Even the sentries on the battlements see him. This ghost doesn't seem to list invisibility amongst his many undoubted talents, which led us to ask, is it possible that Gertrude does see the ghost, but cannot bring herself to admit to Hamlet that she can see him? And the answer is, every single line of the scene works just as well if Gertrude's lying. And once the actress playing Gertrude has decided that she's lying, she has to ask herself why she's lying and whether she's a habitual liar. 
there are good answers to both questions. She's lying because even if she wasn't complicit in the murder of her husband, she knows exactly what happened. And like most of the rest of the court, she knows she's married the murderer. Maybe, like the Gertrude in John Updike's novel, she betrayed her husband with Claudius long before the murder. Maybe her whole story in the play is underpinned by a consuming guilt about what she's done, or at least has allowed to happen. In any event, it was electrifying to watch Claire Higgins as Gertrude cover up her horror at the sight of her husband's ghost and continue to talk to her son as if she'd seen nothing. For those who knew the play, it was an opportunity to watch it as if they'd never seen it before, although there were a few, inevitably, who had seen it before, as Claire turned out not to be the first Gertrude to see the ghost. Another lesson, there are few ideas about Shakespeare that somebody hasn't already had. Peter Holland has been one of the pioneers of a way of writing about Shakespeare that acknowledges that many of his most astute uh, analysts have been actors. Simon Russell Beale is fond of describing actors as three-dimensional liter- uh, uh, is fond of describing acting as three-dimensional literary criticism. And in my personal experience, the most mind-expanding insights into Shakespeare have come from actors in the rehearsal room usually without the long introductory preamble with which directors generally preface even the most banal of suggestions. (laughs) Many directors can barely ask an actor to move to the left without writing an essay about it. (laughs) But actors just get on with it. One day in rehearsal, without warning, David Calder, who played Polonius at the National, approached the end of his speech of advice to Laertes and flinched. He seemed to dry. And then under the heavy weight of what felt like deep personal shame, he said, this above all, to thine own self be true, and it will follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. From the heart, like many or even most fathers, he wants his son not to make his own mistakes. Mired in a corrupt court, he, like everyone else, is incapable of dealing truthfully with others and of being true to himself. And David Calder's Polonius knew it. It would be equally plausible to present the Polonius of tradition, a man incapable of self-knowledge, puffed up with self-regard. But I was electrified by David's illumination of three lines worn thin by their relentless repetition, out of context, usually by public liars wishing to burnish their credentials as truth-tellers. I knew immediately that the colder Polonius had helped Claudius assassinate the old king and was tortured by his own treachery. I started to think that the old king was probably a disaster for Denmark and that, like Richard II, he had to go. Minutes later, we were wondering whether Beria had done away with Stalin. This, I think, was the real Shakespeare, an actor who provides for other actors an infinite myriad of ways of telling his stories and of being his characters. His intuitive openness to interpretation is mistaken for complexity. His relish for ambiguity is taken as a challenge to those who would pin him down. But they are functions of his calling. He writes plays. This is not to deny that his texts are often dauntingly complex. I can't be alone in finding that almost invariably in performance there are passages that fly straight over my head. In fact, I'm going to admit that I hardly ever go to a performance of one of Shakespeare's plays without experiencing blind panic during the first five minutes. I sit there thinking, I have no idea what these people are talking about, and I'm the director of the National (laughs) Theatre. It's worth saying, therefore, that a huge amount of our work in rehearsal goes into achieving the maximum amount of clarity. What is tendentiously called verse speaking seems to me properly to involve not so much the kind of acting that draws attention to the boundless felicities of the text as a commitment to unfolding it comprehensibly. The actors I value most are those who speak Shakespeare as if it's their first language. They're aware of the rhetorical and rhythmic substructure of the text, but they're suspicious of those who would have them reveal it for its own sake. But for all the craft and talent of the best actors, There undoubtedly are occasions when in the theatre most of the audience don't understand what's being said. Sometimes it's deliberate. Leontes stops making sense to the audience when he stops making sense to himself. More often, it's because the passage of 400 years have taken a toll on the immediacy of the language. Of late, this has led me more and more to think that to be true to Shakespeare, you have to confront the incomprehensible stuff head on by cutting it, 
or on occasion by rewriting it. When Hamlet hears for the first time about the appearance of his father's ghost, he says, my father's spirits, my father's spirit in arms. I doubt some foul play. In fact, he doesn't doubt foul play at all, as you all know, because the world has changed meaning. He fears foul play. He thinks foul play was involved. So the line means almost exactly the opposite of what a modern audience would hear. To say what Shakespeare wrote would be to betray what he wanted to say. So I doubt some foul play became I fear some foul play. How many precious seconds in a performance of Othello would it take most of the audience to understand Iago's plan to cause the mutiny of the Cypriot soldiers, whose qualification shall come into no true taste again but by the displanting of Cassio? More seconds than they have available to work out that he means that the Cypriots will not be pacified again but by the displanting of Cassio, because they want to be ready for the next line and the next. So why can't Iago say what he means? And to those from the academy who might flinch, I say, why should 1,100 out of 1,130 people who will come every night to the Olivier Theatre to see Othello be left with the entirely misleading impression that Emilia wants to unpick the embro embroidery from Desdemona's handkerchief before handing it over to Iago? Why, without the benefit of footnotes, should they know that I'll have the work turn out and give it to Iago means she'll have the work copied and give the copy to Iago? I've been arguing that Shakespeare's plays are scores for performance, but sometimes to play the notes he wrote is to play the wrong notes. And how, however many ways there are of playing Amelia, however terrified she may be of her abusive husband, she should never be the kind of friend who would willingly steal Desdemona's handkerchief with no intention of returning it, nor the kind of nutter who'd waste her time on picking its embroidery. <laughs> so at the National, she will say, I'll have the work copied and give it to Iago. With Time of Athens, I went further because the play is quite plainly an unfinished draft, probably never performed, full of good things, but in some important respects, not remotely good enough. Out went the entire scene in the first half of the play when Alcibiades leaves Athens in high dudgeon at the Senate's refusal to grant mercy to his unnamed friend, sentenced to death for an unnamed crime. It's a poorly written scene. The culprit was probably Middleton, which begs more questions than it answers about Alcibiades' motives and was honestly better replaced with the suggestion staged without additional text that his rebellion is rooted in a highly contemporary disgust at the financial elite that turns on time and when he goes bust. Even worse is the visit by the Athenian senators to Timon in his wasteland to ask him to return to Athens to lead their army. Ten minutes before the end of the play, with no prior warning, we're asked to believe that its protagonist is a military genius. This is truly unforgivable dramaturgy, and if it arrived on my desk from a living playwright, I'd send it straight back with a frosty suggestion that it needed more work. In the absence of a living playwright, I did the work myself, and decided that the senators should want what everybody else who visits Timon wants, his money, in their case, to finance the defense of Athens from the rebels. My contribution wasn't great, and it won't trouble the compilers of the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations, but the scene was an improvement on the one that made it into the first folio. <laughs> I don't want to overdo this. Most of the time, the original text does just fine. But it's, all of it <laughs> but it's all of it provisional in the sense that it's waiting to be completed by its actors. And the best of those actors are those who reveal the text by revealing themselves. Shakespeare, more than any other playwright, exposes one of the most persistent misapprehensions about acting, that it should always involve the disappearance of the actor behind the mask of an assumed character, that the best actors are chameleons. I'm much more interested in actors who imagine, whose imaginations are large enough to subsume the characters they play into themselves. And in the way he writes for actors, I think Shakespeare is asking for, themselves, for the same. I'm only a few days into rehearsals for Othello with two superb actors, Adrian Lester, Henry V, and Othello as Othello, and Rory Kinnear, who was Hamlet, as Iago. Adrian may be the first Othello who's come to the part via Henry V, Hamlet, which he played for Peter Brook, and Rosalind, which he played quite beautifully in Declan Donnellan's famous all-male production. Neither of these actors have ever been tricksters. They reveal the men and women they play more through imaginative empathy than through disguising themselves. So here's one final observation from the second week of rehearsals. 
It's often been noted that Iago's motiveless malignancy, in fact, comes in his soliloquies with a myriad of motives, as if he himself has difficulty locating the source of his own depravity. What Shakespeare has done, of course, is to pay his fellow actor the compliment of trusting him to complete Iago for himself. He requires him to be large enough in his imaginative and empathetic capacities to track a psychologically and emotionally plausible path through the play. He provides the actor with a solid enough starting point. Iago seems to be consumed with fury at the promotion of Cassio, angry enough to want to ruin Othello's wedding night. But thereafter, the play works over time not to lock Iago down. Scene by scene, the play asks the actor to imagine what it's like to be Iago, to unfold himself to Iago. Say the actor takes the diagnostic approach. Say he identifies in Iago a specific personality disorder and defines his cunning and callousness as symptoms of psychopathy and then disguises himself as a psychopath. (coughs) This, I think, would distance the actor from the role. He'd end up, as many have ended up, presenting a case study which can degenerate too easily into a series of behavioral tics. But an actor can allow himself to be surprised by what happens to Iago and imagine scene by scene what it would be like to be a man in the situation that Iago's in, confronting the stuff that's happening to him. A man who has perfectly good reasons to be what he is in Act 1, Scene 1, who isn't fully in control of what happens next, as none of us are, to whom the action of the play occurs spontaneously as life happens to all of us. Something far more striking than a case study of a repressed homosexual narcissistic psychopath or whatever may emerge. The audience might be invited not to observe a disordered alien, but to imagine what it would be like to be Iago, so consumed by hatred and envy that he allows them to run out of control. The desire of literary critics over four centuries to solve Iago as if he were a puzzle seems to me to be missing the point. The solution is the actor. The playwright writes from the premise that the the dots can't be joined on the page and writes with the confidence of an actor who knows that if they're any good, his colleagues will do the rest of the job for him. Stand and unfold yourself, says the sentry at the beginning of Hamlet. And if the play demonstrates anything, it is that Shakespeare leaves far too much out of the play for anyone to be able to see the fully unfolded Hamlet on the page. But in the theater, you're seeing much more. You're seeing what Shakespeare intended, his words in the mouth of an unfolded actor. He knew what he was doing, and what he knew was that he had no idea who Hamlet or Iago or Cleopatra or even Francis the pop boy and mistress over on the board were going to turn out to be. Thank you very much. I think um, d- honestly, I wouldn't know enough of the actors who who died before I started going to the theatre. And I think the point I'm making is not so much that actors make literary critics in the sense that they are good writers. Um, literary crit- as I said, you know, there's there's thrilling work um, come out of the academy particularly in the last 20, 20 years, I, I, I think, um, particularly the work that roots Shakespeare um, in the world he lived in and in the theatre he worked for. The point I'm trying to make is that actors, by the way they embody the characters, um, are often insightful uh, in a way that um, it's quite difficult uh, to write about and to analyse, although uh, Peter is one of the literary critics who uh, who, who has achieved um, a new way of looking at Shakespeare through the way he's been performed. Quite often, it's not so much that actors, it seems to me, um, come up with uh, ideas about Shakespeare that then cannot be ignored, 
But what they certainly do uh, is they tell you how Shakespeare um, is working as a contemporary playwright um, era by era. Othello is such a good example of this. Um, I don't know um, what um, uh, Olivier's Othello was like on stage. I, I only know what it was like, what it is like on film, and the answer is or, or, almost nowadays impossible to watch. Um, I don't know how the great 19th century Othellos said each line, but I do know from the way they were described and from the way uh, uh, even theatre critics wrote about their performances that they were that they were telling their audience and, in retrospect, telling us what Othello seemed to be 50 or 100 years ago. And one of the things it seemed to be was a story about um, a, a, an African general uh, who struggles under a thin veneer of Western civilization, of assumed Western civilization, uh, to contain his essential barbarism and under the pressure of um, of uh, Iago's machinations, uh, he reverts to um, uh, something essentially barbaric, African, and chaotic. Now, that seems not only wrong, it seems positively offensive. And Adrian Lester, he won't want to be writing an essay about Othello, but in the way he performs Othello, um, he is, as it were, bearing witness to what Othello is to um, a preeminent British actor of his generation who happens to be black. And it was Adrian's strong intuition long before we started working on it that the play really doesn't have that much to do with race. Uh, it's important that Othello's black. It said so. It, it, it is, it, it is, his, um, his, his Moorish origins are referred to a lot. But they're never referred to by the establishment as anything to be much bothered about. If you compare the way Venice in Othello talks about Othello uh, to the way Venice in The Merchant of Venice talks about Shylock, you can see they had a lot of problems with Shylock's Jewishness and really n no problems at all with Othello being black. It doesn't seem to be that big a deal. Those who make racist comments in the play um, do so because they have plenty of other reasons to dislike Othello or, 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 or wish to do him harm. Uh, it matters to Othello that he is an outsider. That's probably why the story appealed to, uh, to Shakespeare. Um, as an outsider, he is coming to Venice to command, to the army, to Cyprus, um, as someone largely self-constructed. But what it isn't is a play about um, about essential African barbarism. Now, it must have seemed to be that in the 1850s, and that's what their actors were telling them. Um, although I suspect that Ira Aldridge, the great African-American actor about whom there was recently a wonderful play in Kilburn, didn't think that. Um, so it is what I'm saying through, act, through actors uh, that we discover what Shakespeare means to us now. And I'm not even saying that, and I'm certainly not saying, that they were once wrong and now we're right. I'm saying that what was true once is not true anymore, and what is true now what would not have been true then. And the reason is because uh, as plays, these great works don't have one meaning. They're scripts that half of the meaning is in how they're performed and how they're said. And to come back to my final point, Shakespeare was an actor. He knew, he knew what he was doing. He was writing for other actors. And as I also said, and as is so often pointed out, he, he didn't think he was writing literature. He, he, didn't, he took no care for the publication of these things at all, none at all. Well, I've, I think it's um, the question is: Do I, as a stage director, what do I think about Shakespeare in the cinema? I think it's tricky, uh, but my goodness, I think there have been some really good films. I think I think um, uh, it's difficult because um, the way cinema has developed, um, 
it needn't have developed this way, but it is largely, um, it, 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 it largely aspires um, to reflect uh, something much more concerned uh, with the literal truth than the theatre uh, has ever aspired, or the theatre has, um, has turned out not to aspire to reflect. Um, so the first thing a film director, it seems to me, has to do is to perform a very difficult trick, which is to make it seem that there is no other way for these people to be talking than the way they do talk. Um, so the cinema director has to create something like a realistic, something like a coherent world. Um, and you know, remember that uh, a room on a stage is always a metaphor for something else. Uh, whereas a room in a film with a camera in it is just a room. Um, so it's hard to speak blank verse. It's hard, even harder, I think, to speak Shakespeare's prose. The fascinating thing is, the most successful Shakespeare film I've seen in the last 10 years, the, the two most successful Shakespeare films I've seen in the last 10 years, both of them treated him as a contemporary playwright, the Baz Luhrmann, Romeo and Juliet, and the Rafe Fiennes, Coriolanus. In the Ra I still don't know how Rafe pulled this trick off. But in the Rafe Fiennes, Coriolanus, within five minutes, um, it, it, it felt like they were speaking in exactly the way those people in the middle of that civil war, somewhere not very far away, sometime not very long ago, would have spoken. It was done with such daring and panache, the way it was shot, the way it was cut, the whole grammar of it made sense of the fact that they were speaking the way they were speaking. And the, 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 the cast was a, you know, a really kind of um, out there amalgam of great experienced Shakespeareans like Rafe himself and Brian Cox and people who hadn't particularly done Shakespeare before at all and people who didn't even speak English as their first language. That really worked. Um, I think the more reverent and more pompous um, the Shakespeare films are, um, the, the less successful they are. The, Ken Branagh, Henry V, I thought was absolutely wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Um, but so I think it's up to the director. Uh, th th thank you very much, Nick. It was a it's lovely nice. lecture. I, 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 I would like to record it, though. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more about the, the interaction between the actor and the words the actor has to speak. And this is why we want to go on seeing the plays, why we want to go on seeing different actors playing these great roles time and again. It's also, of course, why the performances of the past go out of date. It's why the films or the recorded performances of the past. I don't quite agree with you about Olivier, the Olivier Othello. I saw, it, I saw that film recently. And beforehand, I said it's a bad film. And at the end of it, I said it's a bloody good film. <laughs> because it was such an exciting performance, such a physical performance. Anyhow, that's slightly by the way. Uh, I, I'm very interested, of course, in what you say about substitute, substitution, substituting words occasionally. It's not new. I mean, Peter Brook did it, or in King John, or in the commodity speech, for example. Uh, there was a production at the National long ago with Robert Stevens and Maggie Smith when Robert Graves rewrote the text. In fact, well, partly rewrote the text, but they reverted it back to the original Shakespeare often when they got back on set. But the thing I'm most interested in is the lost, as far as I know, script that Ted Hughes is said to have written for Peter Brook's film of Lear. I'm told that Peter Brook commissioned uh, a, a rewriting of the play in modern verse by Ted Hume. That would have been a wonderful thing to have. You see, the, the, the things <laughs> you've been talking about are minor substitutions of details of the text. What it would be wonderful to be have would be a genuine translation into modern English, and I mean translation in the sense that, say, a Gide translated Hamlet or the Schlegel Teeks, not just a, a paraphrase, which is all too easy and all too simplistic to do, but if we could get a really great writer of our own time 
to tackle Shakespeare and try to convey the complexity of the Shakespearean, not just to simplify it, but to convey the complexity, that would be worth having. And I'm still pursuing a crusade to try to find Ted Hughes's script for King Lear. I'd love to. I'd love to read Ted Hughes's script for King Lear. Listen, I, I mean, I, yes, it's <laughs> Shakespeare is the glory and the curse um, of the British classical theatre. It is, of course, predominantly the glory. It is no accident that when Shakespeare in translation arrives in London, it seems very often so much freer, so much wilder, um, so much more exciting um, than the homegrown product. And that's because they can translate those plays afresh every time. Um, and uh, it, 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 I think maybe, maybe it's our luck that we can do the same with Chekhov. Um, but uh, it, it, it would be, um, I agree with you, Stanley, it would be a, a bold poet who had a go. Um, I think there is an, I mean, on the, I, I was, I was, want, I was obviously being slightly tendentious about, about the rewriting issue, and I don't think it's a particularly major issue, and I don't think it's particularly controversial. But I will say, tell you this, um, I think, not Shakespeare, but there are parts of the Elizabethan Jacobean repertoire which are going to be undoable quite soon. Um, I kind of, on doing The Alchemist, not a particularly difficult play, a few years ago, we I thought we'd um, we'd been quite interventionist, particularly in the first notoriously hard 15 minutes, and still I found that the difficulty of communicating the play to the audience with, with Simon Russell B or Alex Jennings and Leslie Manville, for goodness sake, they really know how to make that start, how to make um, early modern English sing. They really know how to make it compre Ian comprehensible. Um, and Ian Richardson, yeah. But the, fir the first scene is those three. I mean, Ian Richardson, obviously. It was uh, quite a lot of people gave up. They stopped listening. And the, what you find always, it, 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 even in Shakespeare, is if you give up within five or ten minutes, you never tune back in. And one of the things that you have to do if you're acting it now is to make sure that you get them over the hump of the first five yeah, or ten Yeah. I think there were a lot of people who gave up on Johnson. Obviously, Shakespeare's going to last longer because the way we speak now and the way we'll even speak in 200 years is so much. Um, it, it is so much out of Shakespeare, but and maybe if Johnson had been um, thought to be the preeminent dramatist, we'd all talk and think more like Johnson, and Johnson would be easier. But I don't know what's going to happen in in the next hundred years. I think those plays are going to be very very hard to do, and um, uh, apart from repeatedly doing them, I don't have a solution. <laughs> Last question. Much of what you spoke about was, was to do with Shakespeare's openness and generosity to actors and directors and other creators of every generation to ask the question by their own answers, what can we do on stage at this moment? I wonder if you ever have or would admit to those moments in the rehearsal room where those sort of revelatory moments where, where you reduce Shakespearean intention, you think, that's what he wants us to do. There's a moment when he seems to speak very directly and say, this is what you need to do at this moment in the play to tell the story of communicate the character. Do you have those, or is it all very much more, this is what we're doing right now? Mm, um, it's a great question. No, you, you, you often have them. Um, uh, and I would think, oh, probably... 99% of the time, you're having them exactly the same way that other actors and directors have had them over the years. The most that the, the, I find, and because we're a solipsistic lot, those of us who work in the theatre, the bit, the times when you really thrilled, is when, you, is when you 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 realise, um, oh, there were 16 actors in this company, and. Uh, he knew who he was writing for. And the reason that these four lines are here is so that someone can run around the back and come on again as somebody else. Just the trivial stuff like that, where you feel across 400 years that you're in the same job. Although, of course, you know, nobody had my job 400 years ago. It didn't mean me 400 years ago. It didn't mean the, the directors um, 
uh, we're a very, very recent invention, totally spurious. Um, but, uh, but to feel that actors are conning the lines, doing the same job, discovering the same stuff, not necessarily doing it in the same way, you, so, it, you get such a strong sense of, um, of continuity. Can I finish by just telling one story which isn't going to feel like it's about Shakespeare at all? Um, but it will turn out to be. It will turn out to be because it's an illustration of something I once heard Peter Hall say, which I thought sentimental at the time, which is that he knew how to do Shakespeare because he'd learned it from Edith Evans, and Edith Evans had learned it from Paul, and Paul had learned it from somebody else, and Peter quite solemnly takes it right back to Burbage. Um, and I did think, oh, that you know, a good try. Um, I did a, a not very good, not very successful production of um, Importance of Being Earnest about 15, 20 years ago. Um, 15 years ago, maybe. Uh, Maggie Smith was Lady Bracknell. She was quite brilliant. And it should have been wonderful. And it's my fault that it wasn't. And halfway through rehearsals, when it wasn't going brilliantly, Maggie decided that the only way to deal with it was to take me, thank goodness it wasn't going well, because otherwise this wouldn't have happened, to take me to lunch with John Gielgud, who would tell me how to do it. <laughs> so, so she put me in a car one Saturday, and the pair of us drove out to uh, John Gielgud's house, in parenthesis, tragically, the house now belonging to the Blairs. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, an absolutely beautiful Rococo house uh, in Oxfordshire, uh, where Sir John greeted us, and my God, did he give the world's most wonderful performance of Sir John Gilgood. <laughs> the, first, the first thing, you know, famous brick dropper, the first thing he said as he opened the door was, I have no idea why you're playing this part, you're far too common. Um, <laughs> uh, which... She howled. She screamed with laughter. Uh, he did it. I mean, he obviously did it quite deliberately, and he was. And they, uh, they, they adored each other. It was just. It was wonderful to watch. And mostly, what he said about. Mostly, he was about the importance of being honest. What he wanted to talk about. He wanted to complain. He did endlessly about how Edith Evans had completely hijacked the play that in his first production in the 20s, <laughs> some impeccably undistinguished actress had played Lady Bracknell, and, and therefore the play remained um, uh, as Wilde had written it, um, Jack Worthing's play, Ernest's play, and Rose Leclerc, the original Lady Bracknell, was also impeccably undistinguished, and Edith, Edith, Edith Evans had totally ruined it uh, by being so good. And that the advice he was therefore giving Maggie was was the less distinguished you are, the better, which didn't go down very well. But, it's, uh, but, at, what, but the, point about, the point I'm making is at one point, he was talking, and as he was talking about Rose Leclerc and, um, and, the, ori and the original production of, 1590, of 1895, I suddenly said, did you know George Alexander? Not quite remembering when George Alexander, the original Ernest, the original Jack Worthing, and the actor manager who commissioned the play, I'm not quite remembered when he died. And he goes, oh, yes, I didn't know him. He died when I was about 18. Yes, yes, yes I, I thought he was a horrible man. <laughs> and he then talked for quite a long time about George Alexander and other parts he'd seen George Alexander play and how furious he was about George Alexander cutting wild dead and, and, and being now, I think, famously vile to him after Wilde came out of prison. Alexander saw him in Paris, I think. And... That was when I believed Peter Hall, because I thought, this man, John Gielgud, knows how to play Wild because he knew the guy who commissioned Wild to write the play. And if that's, and, and now, uh, more than 100 years after the play uh, was first performed, it didn't do me much good because the show still wasn't that great. <laughs> but I was listening. I did feel I was, I did feel Wild was in the room. I did feel I was listening to someone who was telling me, who, who, but who had the authority to tell me how Wild should be. And so the most exciting moments I do find in rehearsal are the moments where I do kind of think that step by step by step, um, we're, we're, we're kind of doing the same job, rehearsing in the same way in the same city um, as those original actors. So that's um, that I do think. Hazlitt, in a wonderful review of Keane as, as Hamlet, records a bit of stage business that Keane 
does in, 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 in the end of the nunnery scene. And he describes it as the finest commentary that was ever made on Shakespeare. The actor writes commentary by doing a performance. Your productions are full of, of those kinds of moments. Thank you, Nick. Thank you.